This is part 10 in the final part of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. We hope this book was informative. For information about the author, please visit jacasvalley.net. A challenge to research there is in many of us, obviously, a deep-seated desire to assent to extraterrestrial forces, to be embraced by them, overwhelmed by them, and if possible deprived by them of our own weary responsibility for ourselves. Hiccups from Outer Space Russell Davis, Reviewing Close Encounters of the Third Kind In the Observer, March 19, 1978 Although the UFO phenomenon is highly complex and stretches the boundaries of the scientific method, I am not prepared to abandon the rational approach to knowledge for conclusions based on faith, intuition, or the alleged messages received by channels and contactees. There is too much at stake. We have a rare opportunity to improve scientific techniques and to glimpse beyond the limits of ordinary reality. But it would be foolish to attempt it without a clear recognition of certain pitfalls. What I will call, in Chapter 8, the triple cover-up is concerned with these pitfalls, the UFO phenomenon is shielded from direct study by the persistent, misguided official denial of its very existence, it is made more confusing by the reactions and fears of witnesses, and it is further protected from ultimate discovery by its own structure. The subject also carries political overtones. As a source of rumors within military as well as civilian populations, UFO stories can be manipulated for a variety of reasons that may have nothing to do with the government's interest in the phenomenon. We live in a world where any rumor can be exploited, any cult is a potential force, any belief can alter established regimes. The expectation of extraterrestrial visitors is a powerful potential source of new social and political trends. There is no proof that the UFO phenomenon is of extraterrestrial origin. On the contrary, we see in Chapter 9 that several compelling arguments converge to deny the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Finally, in Chapter 10, I present a possible framework for an extension of our current research into the form of reality where the UFO phenomenon seems to originate. 8. Fighting the Triple Cover-Up We are pleased to acknowledge receipt of your letter. Regarding the photographs showing UFOs in formational flight, which you mentioned were taken by Captain Orego of the Chilean Navy near Antarctica in 1948. Regarding this matter we wish to inform you that recently we received a communication from Captain Orego stating that he had not seen any UFOs over Antarctica in 1948. Therefore the photographs requested by you do not exist. Letter from the Chief of the Chilean Naval Mission to an American writer It is forbidden for TV, radio, newspapers, and other news media to divulge UFO reports without the prior censorship of the Brazilian Air Force. Institutional Act No. 5, State Security. Brazilian Government Regulation. The Invisible College. After some 30 years of research into this phenomenon, I have reached new conclusions. Tentative as they are, they shed light on the experiences of abductees and on the reluctance of professional scientists to analyze the facts. I believe that a UFO is both a physical entity with mass, inertia, volume, and physical parameters that we can measure, and a window into another reality. Is this why witnesses can give us at the same time a consistent factual narrative and a description of contact with forms of life that fit no acceptable framework? These forms of life, such as the small gray men seen by Kathy, may be real, yet a product of our dreams. Like our dreams, we can look into their hidden meaning, or we can ignore them. But like our dreams, they may also shape our lives in many ways. The phenomenon has made a significant impact in my own experience. On two occasions I have tracked some unknown objects, using small telescopes. A few of my astronomer colleagues made similar observations, and, after making inquiries, we became aware of sightings kept confidential by professional astronomers the world over. The objects we were tracking were not spectacular, but the reaction they elicited among French scientists fascinated me. Instead of asking if these seemingly maneuverable and impossible objects could be a manifestation of some advanced technology, and in some cases they may well have been terrestrial, they thought only of suppressing the records. They did this by denying every observation, by blaming it on airplanes or planets when the documentation was unassailable and by destroying the data when it was demonstrated that no airplane could have behaved as the objects did. 
The insight I derived from this early experience with dogmatic scientific skepticism brought me into contact with professionals who, like myself, wanted to understand the nature of the phenomenon, and especially to determine whether or not it had an intelligent origin. This group has grown larger over the years. Whimsically, it calls itself the Invisible College. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the American astronomer who served for over 20 years as the Air Force's scientific consultant on UFOs, explained that name in an article called The UFO Mystery, published in the FBI Bulletin, February 1975, way back in the dark ages of science, when scientists themselves were suspected of being in league with the devil, they had to work privately. They often met clandestinely to exchange views and the results of their various experiments. For this reason, they called themselves the Invisible College. And it remained invisible until the scientists of that day gained respectability when the Royal Society was chartered by Charles II in the early 1660s. My interest in UFOs has gone through several phases, but my curiosity has never been satisfied about the behavior of scientists who destroy, distort, or simply ignore the very facts they should investigate. Scientists are not the only ones to blame for the unfortunate stigma still attached to this subject, but such a gap has appeared between the academic position and the beliefs of millions of people that a re-examination of the entire problem is now imperative. We have, on one hand, the facts, thousands of unexplained observations by reliable witnesses. They stand as a monument to the limitations of our understanding. My book Passport to Magonia, published in 1970, contained a catalog of 923 unexplained close encounters, and the size of this evidence is increasing daily. On the other hand, we have a paucity of theories to account for this richness of data. Either these encounters must be invention, delusion, hoax, and mirages, the experts tell us, or else we are being visited by an extraterrestrial race. I cannot subscribe to either explanation. I have argued for many years that the phenomenon could not be explained by hoax and illusion alone, that it contains an opportunity to obtain genuine new knowledge. In this section I hope to go a step further and show why these unexplained observations need not represent a visitation from space visitors, but something even more interesting, a window toward undiscovered dimensions of our own environment. Much of my motivation for examining critically the extraterrestrial theory has come from a study of the information of witness accounts, processed on a computer using modern techniques of analysis. Many of these accounts come from witnesses who describe the occupants of the craft, this material is rich enough for us to form a good idea of these beings' physiology and behavior, if it in fact corresponded to the conditions of biological evolution we can assume on other planets. What we obtain instead is a picture of a different reality that seems to cut through our own at right angles. It is the reality of Magonia. But there is more. In 1971, after an unusual UFO sighting, several puzzling objects fell from the sky. These mistiest fragments were picked up by a Texan who made the mistake of showing them to his friends. The next day two men from Air Force Intelligence came to his door, exhibited their identification papers, and politely requested the evidence. The witness threw them out rudely with a statement that I find admirable, God has made everything in this world, and he has made flying saucers, too, whatever they are. These fragments have fallen into my backyard, and therefore God clearly intended for me to have them. If he had wanted the Air Force to have them, he would have dumped them on the Pentagon. In a survey of technically trained witnesses who had seen an unidentified flying object, it was found that the proportion of those who had bothered to call the Air Force while Project Blue Book was operating was only 1 in 12. This attitude toward the authorities is an important component of the UFO phenomenon. The idea of a cosmic mystery lingers in the more shadowy areas of our imagination. Could it be that the reaction of our society to suppress the reports, to cover them up individually and collectivity, is as much a part of the UFO phenomenon as the objects themselves? The first cover-up, official denial. The first level of cover-up is in the reporting of UFOs. It is the result of the closed mind and negative attitude of government, scientific, and military authorities. More specifically, I call the first cover-up the efforts made by those in a position of authority to discourage the reporting of a UFO incident. 
This can range from the hostile laughter of a local deputy sheriff to intimidation of pilots by their commanding officers, or confiscation of evidence from witnesses. In some cases, the public is led to believe that reporting UFOs is unnecessary because the government knows all about them. Late in 1964, for instance, several friends in Paris sent me interesting data. It seems that somebody there was trying to spread UFO stories through the French news media, the French word for such spreading of rumors is intoxication. A former member of the intelligence service who was regarded as a reliable source made statements to the effect that the British military was carefully monitoring the UFO situation and was pulling its information with the Russians. He went on to say that both countries had now come to the conclusion that the objects were real. Another story circulated among Paris journalists came from an American who claimed the FBI had compiled exhaustive studies of the U.S. cases, a rumor that appears at least partially true, because some landing cases have had elements that brought the event within the jurisdiction of the Bureau. In both of these stories, which originated from quasi-official sources, there was the same reassuring theme, People should not worry about UFOs and should leave the investigation in the hands of the competent authorities, who knew everything there was to know. We were well protected. In the meantime, there was mounting uneasiness among the scientists who had been involved in the UFO debate. Observations were not only coming from witnesses who have outdoor activities, like farmers and truck drivers, but from technically trained observers like engineers, doctors, and professors. The U.S. government must not have known everything there was to know, because in August 1965, Colonel Spaulding made inquiries among top scientists associated with his office at the Air Force. He asked them specifically what they thought of submitting the UFO files to the Academy of Sciences, or to some such highly respected body, in a renewed effort to reassure the public and find out the truth. As a result, early in November 1965, the Scientific Advisory Board of the Air Force met in Dallas and discussed the UFO question. The idea of a so-called independent study was first considered at that meeting. A physicist, Dr. Brian O'Brien, headed a special study group that came back with a recommendation that the Air Force spend $250,000 a year to obtain high-grade data. The very fact that a new study was recommended seems to show that any suppression of information or any leaking of wild rumors was not the result of a secret military policy on the UFO subject but more likely a product of the confusion that is rampant at all levels of federal bureaucracy. The military was reacting to the sightings in direct proportion to their impact on the press, which they were trying to minimize, and these reactions were clumsy. The confusion that resulted was unbelievable. The best example of this was the swamp gas crisis. The swamp gas scandal. The swamp gas episode played a decisive role in influencing public opinion at a key moment in the history of the UFO problem, so it provides a model for local and national passion. The swamp gas crisis began for me on Monday morning, March 21, 1966. I was listening to a Chicago radio program when the news of the Michigan sightings was broadcast. Four objects were said to have flown over a farm near an arbor, and one of them had landed in a swampy area. It sounded fairly typical. In 1964 I had established that more landings tended to occur in isolated places, a fact that was first apparent in the computer analysis of French cases. Eventually, using Air Force data, I convinced Dr. Hynek that the same pattern existed in the United States. Swamps like the Everglades region of Florida and rugged regions, like central France or the American Northwest, were among the places UFOs seemed to prefer. In 1965 as I have pointed out, there had been a series of reports by Australian farmers describing craft that left circular traces in swamp vegetation there. That Monday morning I called Dr. Hynek to alert him to the sightings in Michigan, and he in turn called Project Blue Book in Dayton, Ohio to propose that it investigate at once. He suggested that we go there before reporters and curiosity seekers destroyed the evidence. The officer in Dayton was not interested, as Dr. Hynek later told me. The case hasn't been reported officially to the Air Force, said the officer. That's not very scientific, Dr. Hynek remarked. I don't give a damn, was the literal answer. Half an hour later, Project Blue Book called back, how soon can you be in an arbor? I thought you weren't interested. Well, 
Someone has reported the case officially to us just a minute ago. Who was that? The Pentagon. They are deluged with calls. Every reporter in the country wants to know what's going on. The next morning, Dr. Hynek was in Michigan. What happened in an arbor is a classic example of misunderstanding with the press. Hynek was under tremendous pressure to release a statement prematurely, as the urging of public relations people from the Air Force. In his statement, he called for thorough investigation of the phenomenon but also mentioned that some people in Michigan might have seen swamp gas. The press took this for a final verdict and exploded with anger. How dare this academic man from Chicago challenge the word of an honest farmer and seriously suggest that he had not seen what was evidently a real flying saucer? Those irate comments came from the same newspapers who for years had ridiculed witnesses just like this poor farmer, and had given no support whatsoever to Dr. Hynek when he begged them to report UFO cases more accurately. Suddenly it became fashionable to believe in flying saucers. In March 1966, reporters were beating the bushes of Michigan looking for Martians and UFO experts. The switch took the Air Force by surprise and destroyed the image of Project Blue Book in a few short days. Public reaction carried the case to Washington, with help from a then-local politician, Gerald Ford, who demanded that full attention be given to what had become known as the Swamp Gas Scandal. A meeting of the Space Committee of the Senate pondered the question first and decided quickly that NASA should not get involved. The space agency had its public image to preserve and declined to have anything to do with the subject. So they handed this hot potato to the Armed Forces Committee of the House. Early in April 1966, the Secretary of the Air Force was reported to be in favor of a scientific analysis of the 648 cases classified as unidentified at that time in the Blue Book files. Late that month, the governor of Florida and several reporters saw an unknown flying object from the governor's private plane. These reports created a stir, but the outrage over the Michigan incident had already subsided. It was almost two months old and no longer newsworthy. An official cover-up was falling back into place. A television documentary carried the debunking of the subject to new heights, it showed Harvard astronomer Donald Menzel pouring some benzene over a tank full of acetone to demonstrate optical properties that were common knowledge since the 18th century. He was trying to convince the audience that UFOs were nothing but mirages. Let me know next time it rains benzene, will you? I asked my wife. We'll go out and watch the flying saucers. Menzel's number was followed by a classical interview with a contactee who was relied upon to provide comic relief by describing his meetings with the Space Brothers. His edited statements seemed to be carefully chosen to make him look as crazy as possible. In contrast with this man, the next interview was an impressive discussion with another astronomer who stated with authority that extraterrestrial visitations were extremely improbable. The documentary also contained an interview with a military officer who stated that no UFOs were ever detected on radar screens and an interview with an astronomer who declared that no UFOs were ever seen or photographed by satellite tracking stations. Both statements were outright lies. It is true that radar never sees UFOs, but that is only because military operators call them something else. In their jargon they speak of UCTs, uncorrelated targets. At the time the documentary was shown, the Western Defense System was recording about 700 of these baffling UCTs per month. There had even been a suggestion by a highly respected astronomer that the military modify their computer program to gather information about these UCTs rather than ignoring them because they didn't fit the trajectory of incoming missiles. The suggestion was not implemented. Scared scientists. Why are scientists remaining silent? Many astronomers must know what I knew from my days at Paris Observatory, namely that we were tracking unidentified objects and even photographing them. Were professional scientists afraid of the emotional reaction their statements might trigger in a generally uninformed and credulous public? Or were they simply afraid of losing their reputations? Whatever the reason, it could not justify the deliberate destruction of scientific data. Even the idea of not saying anything that might cause fear did not hold water. The Michigan incident proved that fear could spread much faster, and with much more destructive effects, among a population that had been kept systematically ignorant of the facts. 
child psychologists know very well that it is better to prepare the child for the idea that his grandfather is not going to live forever than to let him discover it when death suddenly strikes. Similarly, by denying the existence of the mystery the scientific community is taking serious chances with the belief system of the public. In my opinion, such attitudes have contributed to the long-term loss of popular support and respect for science, and these attitudes continue to be one of the factors that drives the public toward the many cults, which plague this field. Throughout that period much was happening under the surface, however. We began receiving letters and phone calls from specialists who wanted to participate in the investigation of the phenomenon. In his absorbing book The UFO Experience, Dr. Hynek has described how this little group grew during the late 60s and early 70s. If this network ever decided to become visible, a brilliant panel of scientists could rapidly be assembled from its ranks to deal effectively with this new area of research. Given current conditions, however, it is probably best for these people to continue their investigations in private. The history of the Condon investigation at the University of Colorado convinced many of us of this. What Condon didn't know? My own impression of the Condon fiasco is not simply a cover-up scenario. I believe that the Air Force late in 1966 was utterly fed up and wanted to get out of the business. After over 20 years of analysis of this problem, the military was in essence saying to academia, with good reason, we have found no evidence that it lies within our mission. The objects are not openly behaving as enemies of the United States. We do not even know what they are made of, and every time we submit a case to the scientists they ridicule our pilots, who are only guilty of trusting their own eyes and their own instruments. We have had enough of this, here are the data. It is your turn to see what you can make of these phenomena. The scientific community, which had been so eager to make statements before the cameras to explain UFOs as long as the Air Force was in charge, reacted coolly to the suggestion that their own pet explanations should be seriously tested on a larger scale. Several universities, including Harvard and Columbia, were contacted by the Department of Defense, but they turned down the assignment and the research money for it. The Europeans followed this development with keen interest and eagerly anticipated the American decision, for their official policy would be modeled after the U.S. stand on the matter. There was explosive material in the European files. Many of the sightings were extremely well documented, and classified investigations of the highest caliber had been made much more thoroughly and professionally than even the best cases in the U.S. Air Force files. And no wonder. Some of the witnesses had been of the highest political rank. In one European country, a near landing had taken place on the chief of state's private estate. The craft had been described in detail by members of the official's entourage. This meant that the investigation had been conducted at the very top level. The chauffeur of this high political authority, as described in a report of the sighting, while driving through the estate, sees what he believes to be an aircraft trying to land on the road, directly in front of him. He stops the car immediately. The object passes just a few meters above the stopped car and, while doing this, causes violent vertical vibrations in the vehicle. A few seconds later, the object reverses its course and passes again, now in the opposite direction, with the same effects on the car. Then, having regained its position above some trees where it had initially appeared, it makes a fast change of altitude, a 90 degree tilting with respect to the horizontal, and darts away to the west. The witness is highly reliable, the report goes on. We found that the object, an upside down plate with a central turret and portholes, could be of the dimensions reported by the witness, namely 20 meters. Such an observation was no joke. Yet neither the U.S. Air Force nor the American academic community was aware of the extent of the problem in Western Europe. The Soviets were possibly even more interested than the West Europeans. The rumor that spread in Europe through informal channels during the summer of 1966 was difficult to verify, but in view of later events in the history of the Condon Committee it has some interest. According to that rumor, the Air Force was completely frustrated with the UFO problem and was looking for an excuse to get rid of it. The only problem was to find a university willing to write a negative report after a cursory examination of the facts. This, I repeat, was only a rumor, but this rumor was taken seriously enough in Paris to prevent the creation of an investigation committee similar to the American one.
The Russians made some moves toward the creation of a committee but cleverly awaited the developments in the United States before funding it and giving it an official stamp of approval. In Boulder, Colorado, a group was finally being assembled with much fanfare, headed by Dr. Condon, a prestigious physicist close to retirement. The group had received a sizable grant to ponder ufology, and its report was due in 1969. It would prove to be negative. Destroying the data. In November 1966, when the Condon Committee started gathering testimony from people who had done research into UFO cases, Dr. Hynek and I were the first scientists asked to come to Boulder to brief the group. We soon noticed that one of the administrators, Bob Lowe, was clearly the key decision maker on the team, although he had no science degree and seemed to have little interest in the matter. Yet there was a certain euphoric feeling in the room, a sense of embarking on a unique adventure. There was little passion in the press now, the Michigan swamp gas crisis had been largely forgotten. The problem was in the hands of the scientists, and it had become as dull as any venture that is in the process of being rationalized away by the academic mill. If the journey to the moon can be turned into the exasperating bore that modern technology has generated, there is no reason to expect that the same lack of interest will not settle over the UFO mystery once it falls into the hands of big science. The first astronauts to die in orbit will probably die of ennui when they run out of buttons to push, digits to read out, and jokes with Houston about the football scores, as early as February 1967, members of the Condon Committee were privately approaching their scientific colleagues on other campuses, asking them how they would react if the committee's final report to the Air Force were to recommend closing down Project Blue Book. Not surprisingly, a few months later the work of the committee had come to a standstill. Field investigations were non-existent. Questionnaires were sent out to witnesses, but only one assistant was aviable to encode the results for the computer file, where the bulk of the information was provided by the 3,000 punch cards I had turned over to the committee. A minority faction of the group caused a crisis when it rebelled. After a series of incidents that Dr. Dave Saunders documented in his book, UFOs. Yes, the team split into two factions. An early restricted memorandum discovered and published by the minority group provided evidence that the Condon Committee had never intended to look seriously into the UFO problem. Publication of this document so outraged Condon that he fired the minority group and ran the project without any further consideration of the possible reality of the phenomenon. The files of the committee were eventually destroyed, one would think that they belonged to the scientific fraternity or to the public domain, since American taxpayers paid for the research. Not so. When the project wrote its report the files were locked up by the University of Colorado in Boulder. They were later transferred to a private home and were burned shortly thereafter. The second cover-up, convenient explanations. The little town of Carteret lies on the western coast of Normandy, France, about 20 miles from Cherbourg. It is situated directly to the north of wonderful Mont Saint-Michel, a monastery that, as legend goes, was built by the devil. On December 2, 1973, a very strange thing happened on the beach at Carteret. Two fishermen, Mr. G. Jean, 44, and his son Noel, 18, got up at 5 a.m. to retrieve their nets at low tide. When they arrived on the beach half an hour later, they saw a very bright object directly over the area where their nets had been spread. They walked toward it until they estimated they were about 150 yards away, and it appeared as an intense yellow window, 8 feet long and 5 feet high, emitting a cone-like beam directed toward the ground. The two fishermen were afraid and decided not to go closer. They tried to work without thinking about the object, but then it changed suddenly, the yellow light was turned off. Over the area where it had been hovering there was now a blue-green football that flew away at 6.05 a.m. Jeans reported the sighting to the French police. My wife and I investigated this sighting during a research trip through the west of France in December 1973. Many strange data came to the surface. First we found that this was not the first sighting. Two months earlier, the young man had seen three yellow spheres in staggered formation over the same beach while driving with his brother-in-law. That sighting took place about 7 p.m., and the spheres appeared to be about 12 to 15 feet above ground. What was the pattern of the lights? We asked Noel Jean. There was a yellow light, a second one above, a third one to the left above again, 
and some metal in between. What was it doing? The lights came on and off and it followed the car. And you, what did you do? We stopped to look at it, and when we got back into the car the lights were turned off on the object. Since the second sighting the elder man has decided not to go out of his house anymore. He no longer goes fishing. He locks himself in his room when the investigators come to ask him questions. Does he know something he does not want to discuss? We saw no traces on the beach. The gendarmes confirmed to us that the grass in the dunes had not been affected. The barbed wire nearby was checked for magnetic effects. The test was negative. We heard that a local ham radio amateur had noticed at the time of the near landing that his receiver was blocked out for several minutes. It was in the middle of the nets, Noel Jean told us. The papers have said that it measured 1.5 by 1.5 meters, we pointed out. That's not true. It was rectangular, about 2.5 by 1.5 meters. It was as big as a stove. What time did it end? We got there at 5.30. It disappeared between 5.50 and 6.05. What happened when the object disappeared? We went away looking at the rectangular light all the time, and it turned toward the dunes, then came back on us. It was turned off, and then we saw a small blue-green ball above the spot. It got smaller, and after six we couldn't see anything anymore. How big was the ball? It was like a soccer ball. What did you do when you got on the beach and saw the rectangle of light? I started going toward it, but it got brighter and brighter. So my father said, forget it, come back to this side. There is a large radar installation near Cherbourg, at a place called Mopperthuis, located 38 kilometers away from Carteret. The range of the antenna is 200 kilometers. At 6.10 a.m. on that particular morning it picked up an echo in the southwest, moving to the north of Cherbourg. An object flying from the direction of Carteret toward Great Britain would have followed this course. The same morning something peculiar happened on the coast. The French trawler Archipel, which was close to the rocky shore of Erville directly west of Cherbourg, on the trajectory the object must have followed if the radar echo corresponds to the UFO, went off course. In view of the frequently observed magnetic perturbations in the vicinity of a UFO, it can be hypothesized that its magnetic navigation system gave erroneous indications. The boat got too close to the coast, hit the rocks, and sank, fortunately without loss of life. The observation of the yellow window on the beach had lasted no less than five minutes. Why had the two fishermen not walked closer to the object to ascertain its nature? There seems to be two reasons, first, the window became brighter as they walked within 150 yards, and this discouraged them from approaching any closer, and, second, they felt paralyzed with fear. Whether this paralysis was an actual physiological inhibition or the result of psychological fear, or both, has not been ascertained. The observation had taken place early Sunday morning. The following Friday, local people discovered some interesting items on a nearby beach. These consisted of a complete set of professional underwater exploration equipment, a radioactivity tester, sonic signalers, along with trousers and jackets with English language labels. Suddenly the local police, with the assistance of the DSD, French counterintelligence, and the STIS, main intelligence arm of the French government, discovered that the whole sighting was a case of underwater radiation detection. Such was the substance of the carefully designed rumor that began circulating. This is what I call the second cover-up, the release of carefully contrived official explanations that do not really explain anything but which provide skeptics with an excuse for dismissing the story. Difficult cases are swept under the rug at all cost if psychological pressure on the witness is not enough to discourage him from telling his story in the first place. How could the discovery of some diving equipment on a nearby beach explain the two observations of the unidentified objects? What about the radar echo? The explanation is completely invalid, but it is typical of stories engineered to discredit witnesses and reassure local populations. These objectives are generally reached. The witnesses are intimidated, and the local police, the only source of accurate data, are generally anxious to see things return to normal. Besides, they have jobs to protect. We were fortunate to be able to investigate this case within a few days of the events, before the cover-up was organized. 
What would be the reaction of a scientist stumbling upon such a case a few weeks or a few months later? He would simply brush it aside, and with some reason. The witnesses quickly become uncooperative, one of them stays home and will not talk to visitors, the local police no longer have anything to say, the military radar operators in Cherbourg have received orders to deny their statements of the night in question, and the information that appears in the newspapers is confused, garbled, and inaccurate. A local newspaper published a cartoon showing the little town of Carteret with a flying saucer and a Martian in the foreground. A smiling Frenchman has approached the little Martian and asks, What kind of mileage do you get? Laughter releases the lingering tension. In a later development, which will appear ironic in light of the cover-up attempts at Carteret, a French cabinet member acknowledged for the first time the reality of the UFO problem as a subject fit for scientific research. In March 1974, the Minister of Defense, Robert Galley, agreed to participate in a series of radio interviews that included reports from witnesses and statements by three French scientists who had studied the UFO phenomenon for many years, Dr. Pierre Guerin, of the Paris Astrophysical Institute, Dr. Claude Poor, head of scientific studies for the French equivalent of NASA, and myself. What the defense minister told reporter Jean-Claude Bure that day might be a lesson for other government officials around the world, I am deeply convinced that we must regard these phenomena with an attitude of completely open mind. A number of breakthroughs have been made in the history of mankind because someone has attempted to explain the unexplainable. Now, among these aerial phenomena that have been gathered under the label of UFOs, it is undeniable that there are facts that are unexplained or badly explained. In 1954 the Defense Ministry created a special section for the gathering and study of witness accounts regarding these unidentified flying objects. I have before me a number of these accounts, that have developed over the years until 1970, there are approximately 50 of them. Among the earliest ones is a statement of personal observation by Lt. Demery, Jean, from Air Force Base 107 at Villa Cublay, dated November 20, 1953. There are also reports from the gendarmerie and some observations from pilots and air center commanders. There are many elements, whose convergence is of concern, during the year 1954. Therefore the attitude one must have is that of a completely open mind, an attitude in which one does not deny the observations a priori. Our ancestors in prior centuries must have denied the reality of a number of things that seem to us today absolutely elementary, like piezoelectricity or static electricity, not to mention biological phenomena. In fact, the entire development of science consists in the fact that, at a given time, we realize that we have had mistaken ideas about the reality of certain phenomena. It is difficult to add anything to this statement. It is not clear that the simple fact of keeping an open mind about UFOs will in itself make a breakthrough possible but science should certainly welcome the lifting of the government's attitude that has prevented it from examining the facts. The third cover-up, the UFO denies itself. We have so far discussed two forms of cover-up, one, pressure placed on witnesses to discourage them from telling their story, and, two, fabrication of explanations when a witness does speak. I believe that to these factors we must add a third one, the built-in silencing mechanism of the phenomenon itself. On December 3, 1967, a patrolman named Herb Shermer, of Ashland, Nebraska, had an experience that deserves to be placed in the context of the stories of the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill and of the Pascagoula fishermen. At 2.30 a.m. Shermer saw on the road an object with a row of flickening lights. Believing it to be a truck, he turned on his high beams. The object took off. The 22-year-old patrolman drove back to the station and wrote his entry saw a flying saucer at the junction of highways 6 and 63. Believe it or not, Shermer went home with a strong headache and a buzzing noise that prevented him from sleeping. He also had a red welt below the left ear. The case came to the attention of the Condon Committee, and Shermer was placed under hypnosis. It then became clear that there was a 20-minute period during which he remembered nothing. Later, at the suggestion of another researcher, he was again placed under hypnosis, revealing an extraordinary sequence of events. As he saw the object take off, the patrolman decided to follow it and drove up a dirt road toward the intense light. He tried to call the police at Wahoo, Nebraska, 
but the radio was not working and a car engine died. The object, metallic and football shaped, was surrounded by a silvery glow. It was making a whooshing sound, and the lights were flickering rapidly. Legs appeared under the craft, and it landed. Shermer wanted to drive home, but he was prevented by something in his mind. The occupants of the craft came toward the car. He was unable to draw his revolver. In the standard pattern they shot some greenish gas toward the car, pulled a small object from a holster, flashed a bright light at him, and he passed out. The next thing Shermer remembered, under hypnosis, was rolling down the car window and talking to the occupant of the craft, who pressed something against the side of his neck and asked him, Are you the watchman over this place? Then pointed to the power plant and said, Is this the only source of power you have? Shermer was taken aboard the craft. He saw control panels and computer-like machines. The occupants were wearing coveralls with an emblem of a winged serpent. One of them pushed a button and tape started running. Through my mind. Somehow? He is telling me things. My mind hurts. The occupants gave Shermer a lot of interesting but clearly misleading information. They wanted him to believe that they came from a nearby galaxy. They had bases in the United States. Their craft was operated by reverse electromagnetism. Their ships had been knocked out of the air by radar, by ionization. They drew power from large water reservoirs. Shermer got the idea that they have no pattern for contacting people. It is by pure chance so the government cannot determine any patterns about them and there will be a lot more contacts. To a certain extent they want to puzzle people, he reported. They know they are being seen too frequently and they are trying to confuse the public's mind. Finally the occupant told Shermer that he was not to remember the inside of the ship. He concluded, you will not speak wisely about this night. We will return to see you two more times. And at one point, in a hauntingly beautiful moment, one of the men took Shermer to the large window of the ship, pointed to the deserted landscape around them, and said gravely, Watchman, someday you will see the universe. If the occupants are so advanced, and do not want Shermer to speak wisely of that night, why could he remember so much of it under hypnosis? Have they not anticipated this method of disclosure? Or could it be that some parts of the human mind are inaccessible to them? Could it be that their power is more limited than their actions imply? Could it be that someone, or something, is playing a fantastic trick on us? The phenomenon negates itself. Perhaps you have had the opportunity to attend a magic show performed by an excellent master of that remarkable profession. He produces before you, under impossible conditions, a phenomenon that is clearly unexplainable. But then he appears to realize how disappointed the audience is. Indeed, everyone feels almost insulted by the preposterousness of his performance. There must be a simple explanation, an obvious trick. You do not find it. Then the magician explains everything, the table tops was hollow, the cane was made of small sliding sections that collapse into a different shape. Now you have understood everything, you kick yourself for not immediately perceiving such a simple solution. You leave the room with a warm feeling of gratefulness and a certain amount of pride, I am not so stupid after all. This performer hasn't had me fooled for long. As you get home, new doubts begin to creep into your rational mind. You obtain all the objects necessary for accomplishing the same trick by the simple method so nicely laid bare before you just an hour earlier, and then you realize that the explanation itself is impossible, that the magician never told you the real technique. The UFO phenomenon enjoys the same recursive unsolvability. It leaves indices behind, but they seem to be even more maddeningly misleading than the witnesses' accounts. The phenomenon negates itself. It issues statements and demonstrates principles where some of the information conveyed is true and some is false. Determining which is the true half is as an exercise left to the investigator. In another relevant case the main witness was fooled by sociologists, the believers were fooled by alleged spacemen calling themselves the guardians, the public was fooled by the believers, and the sociologists may have been fooled by the phenomenon itself. Contact with a group called the Guardian started when a Midwesterner referred to as Mrs. Keach woke up one winter morning with a tingling or numbness in her arm, my whole arm felt warm right up to the shoulder. I had the feeling that someone was trying to get my attention. Without knowing why, 
I picked up a pencil and a pad that were lying on the table near my bed. My hand began to write in another handwriting. Through the messages she got, this woman was gradually introduced into something she regarded as the realms of the life beyond, until one day she received a message of comfort from an elder brother. As described in Leon Festinger's book When Prophecy Fails, I am always with you. The cares of the day cannot touch you. We will teach them that seek and are ready to follow in the light. I will take care of the details. Trust in us. Be patient and learn, for we are there preparing the work for you as a conoiter. That is an earthly liaison duty before I come. That will be soon. Mrs. Keach came to think of this as genuine channeling with higher entities and began telling people that amazing new knowledge was coming through. Soon a small sect formed in the Midwestern city where she lived. One of the leaders of the sect was a Dr. Armstrong, whose real name was Lawhead, a man who later became involved in the Uri Geller affair. The Guardians gave the group teachings and advice. They also predicted future events, landings of flying saucers, and visits from spacemen. One of these predictions was of a spacecraft landing at a nearby military airfield. The small group drove to a spot from which they could see the runways and observe the scene and the sky in vain, but suddenly a man approached the party and, upon looking at him, all present felt an eerie reaction to his appearance. No one had seen him approaching. He was offered something to drink and declined. He walked with a curious, rigid bearing. A moment later he was gone, but no one had seen him go away. As such stories began circulating the belief structure of the little sect became better established. It accumulated its own folklore and even created its own vocabulary, special words with special meanings. Mrs. Keach was now writing as much as 14 hours a day. The teachings became increasingly concerned with religious matters, cosmology, and flying saucers. One day, the great message finally came through. It was forecasting a disaster, an earthquake and a flood, and the saving of the believers by their space brothers, the region of Canada, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi, to the Gulf of Mexico, into the Central America will be as changed. The great tilting of the land of the U.S. to the east will throw up mountains along the central states. The group now felt a special responsibility to tell the world about these momentous events. They issued press releases, some of which were picked up by local papers. This in turn attracted the attention of a team of sociologists at the University of Minnesota who were investigating the behavior of individuals and social movements based on specific prophecies. They obtained a Ford Foundation grant to study Mrs. Keech's group and received logistical support from the university's laboratory for research in social relations. They began infiltrating the sect, pretending to be sincere converts, and attending meetings to monitor the evolution of its beliefs as the appointed time for the fulfillment of the prophecy drew nearer. Although the use of such deceptive methods by scientists is now very much under question, the book When Prophecy Fails, written by the sociologists on the basis of their investigations, is essential for anyone trying to understand the complex nature of the belief in UFOs. The book details the efforts made by members of the sect to warn mankind of impending doom and describes their belief that those who would be drowned would be spiritually reborn on other planets appropriate to their spiritual development, but that flying saucers would come down from the sky in time to save the believers from the flood. The predicted events, as the reader must be aware by now, did not come to pass. The Midwestern part of the United States has not been engulfed by the ocean, and the many countries slated for destruction are still above sea level. What did this mean for the beliefs of the sect? It actually served to reinforce their conviction, because they could take credit for the avoidance of the destruction. Some earthquakes did take place in desert areas around the date of the cataclysm. Had they struck a populated region the damage would have been considerable. Hence, they speculated, it may have been the light shed by the small group of faithful believers that had spared the country from disaster. Some members of the sect also theorized that it had been another test of their ability to believe blindly, to follow without discussion the orders they received from their guardians, and to face ridicule without fear. Why bring the story of Mrs. Keech into the discussion of a scientific study of UFOs? Many sociologists will argue that her case is typical of many small sects and cults and that adequate theories now exist to explain their behavior. To a very great extent this is true, 
but I am not convinced that the mechanism that gives rise to the founding of such movements is fully understood, and I do not believe that their potential impact on society has been made explicit. The case of Mrs. Keach is important to all scientists who have an interest in the UFO phenomenon because it provides a prototype for an increasing number of groups that establish themselves around similar belief systems. One of the most publicized of these groups in recent years is the network of Uri Geller devotees, which has succeeded in arousing the interest of several leading physicists. In Geller's case, like Mrs. Keech's, there are several unexplained phenomena that provide a basis for the beliefs of the group. In both cases, too, we are told to expect higher knowledge to come from the UFOs. And in both cases there is an impact on the collective consciousness. What about the prophetic element? Mrs. Keech predicted a flood and salvation from above. Uri Geller and Dr. Andriha Puharich once forecasted massive flying saucer landings. Many people around the country, whom author John Keel has appropriately called the silent contactees, are keeping to themselves what they regard as revelations made to them by alien entities. Perhaps people have always had such experiences. Perhaps they were purely religious, hence private, in times past, and only the relative acceptance of modern UFO sightings by a segment of the media and by a few curious scientists has encouraged the partial disclosure of some of the contacts. Whatever the case may be, we tend to discount too easily any phenomena that contain seemingly absurd elements. This is the third cover-up. It is tempting to place Mrs. Keech and all people like her into a category neatly labeled in sociological terms, like doomsday believers and those with cognitive dissonance, preferably with the magic term behavior tacked on. Examining the details of her story, however, should make us a bit cautious. There is, for example, the matter of the strange man she met in the first prophetic instance. The academic investigators felt they were on such strong theoretical ground that they neglected to ascertain whether the mysterious appearance and disappearance of the stiff-legged entity could be confirmed by others. This lack of follow-up must be deplored. On two other occasions, Mrs. Keech had been visited by strange people. The first incident followed the disclosure of her flood forecast in the local papers. Two men came to her door and asked to talk to her. One of them was a perfectly ordinary human, but his companion was very strange and did not say a single word during the visit. She asked who they were, and the first man replied, I am of this planet, but he is not. The point of their discussion, which lasted for half an hour, was that she should not publicize her information beyond what she had already done. The time is not right now, the man said before leaving with his companion. This encounter had been deadly serious. As a result Mrs. Keech gave up her plans to publish a book about her experiences. There was another visit a few months later, this time by five young visitors who spent two hours trying to convince Mrs. Keech and a scientist who was a member of her group that their information was incorrect, that everything they were predicting was wrong. The investigators again made no effort to identify these visitors, which is in my opinion a serious oversight. They simply reported, why these young men called at the house what their purpose was, and who they were, these are things we do not know, they may have been practical jokers, or they may have had a serious purpose. In describing her discussion with the later visitors, Mrs. Keech said, shocked and weeping, that, they kept forcing me to take back things. He kept trying to pressure me into saying they were not true. They kept telling me that what I said was all false and mixed up and they told me that they were in contact with outer space too and all the writings I had were wrong and that everything I was predicting was wrong. Now the ring of absurdity around Mrs. Keech was complete. She was experiencing the third cover-up. The flood would not take place. The believers who had trusted all the signs and the obvious sincerity of their medium or channel would be left completely isolated, having lost or resigned their jobs, in some cases having sold all their earthly possessions, committed to a reality that only they could perceive, they would be forever unable to tell the whole story. The most highly educated man in the group, a local professor, would eventually comment, I've had to go a long way. I've given up just about everything. I've cut every tie. I've burned every bridge. I've turned my back on the world. I can't afford to doubt. I have to believe. And there isn't any other truth. You're having your period of doubt now, but hang on, boy, hang on.
This is a tough time but we know that the boys upstairs are taking care of us. This is a frightening view, one that in the future may take new forms and engulf more people. Such is the result of the three cover-ups. There is a pattern behind this structure, and that pattern is not contact but control. This is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. We hope that this book was informative. Knowledge is power, so don't be left out in the dark. For more information about the author please visit jackasvalley.net. Thank you for listening.